Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope your day's been going well so far. Uh, on behalf of ShareSite and Live Sherpa, I'm excited to kick off this session on strategies on optimizing your portfolio. Um, well, those of us who haven't um, heard of ShareSite or are just looking for like a refresher about who we are, ShareSite is an online portfolio tracker that empowers investors by simplifying complex investment data, helping them make informed decisions and become savvy investors. Uh, with 400,000 users globally, our goal is to bring institutional level insights to all investors from beginners to experienced investors, as well as intermediaries such as accountants and financial advisors. Uh, today's session is led by Wynn Scully, who is taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down with us and share his strategies on optimizing your portfolio. Wins is the founder and CEO of Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable financial advice service. Uh, he's a veteran of financial advisors with over 35 years of experience in finance and was named one of Australia's 50 most influential advisors of 2023 by the Financial Standard. He is also a best-selling author of two books, having, having also written Live the Life You Want with the Money You Have, a money handbook for the new generation, which I highly recommend for everyone who's like me, a beginner investor or a seasoned investor to give it a read. It's really helped me understand markets and adapt and create my own investment strategy as I dive through the world of investment. Uh, just a few hygiene checks. Uh, we will have some time for questions towards the end. So during the presentation, if you have anything to ask Wins, just pop your questions in the Q&A box on your right that you see, and we'll try our best to get to all of them uh, towards the end. Uh, and well, let's get started without taking too much time. Over to you, Wins. Thanks, Mungi. That was a great introduction. And the purpose of today is really just to introduce investing over this session and the coming sessions. I hope to get through everything you need to know and everything you need to do to be successful at investing. And today we're going to start at the getting started piece. Um, laying the foundations is always the key to building a solid building. And today we'll start with those foundations. So let's get cracking. Where's my mouse? There we go. So the first point is when's the right time to get to get investing? We can't really time the market. So what matters is when you're ready. And I've got a bit of a five-step checklist that I get, get our members to work through uh, to check whether they're ready. If you're regularly spending less than you earn, You've got an emergency stash that you're comfortable with. You've paid off all your red debts. Now, red debts in life show to speak, we, we don't talk about good debts and bad debts. Um, we divide debts into um, red debts, which is largely credit cards and personal loans. They arise from just spending more than you earn. Um, amber debts um, being debts that are paying for an asset over its lifetime, like your car loan or your home loan. Let's not worry too much about these at this point. And then your green debts are the ones that build your uh, future income or assets. So HEX, uh, investment property loans, uh, margin loans. Um, you've got some cash that you don't plan on spending for the next few years. If you're planning on spending the money in six to 12 months, it probably doesn't have a place in the market. And then finally, particularly right now with higher interest rates, you've considered whether investing is the better answer compared to paying off your home loan or topping up your super. And that answer is different for everybody. But let's assume we've got five ticks in those boxes and we're ready to start investing. Um, the, um, when it comes to investing, there are three main levers that you can pull. There's how much you, you're able or willing to invest how long you're going to invest for, and the return you can target. You can sort of choose any two of those, and the third one will uh, will uh, will fall out. So, for example, um, if you want to aim, if you're aiming to accumulate one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you can set aside a thousand dollars a month, 
If you can earn 4.5%, you'll get there in 10 years. If you want to do it a little bit more quickly, you'll need to target a higher return. And um, an 11% return would get you there in eight years. And 11% is probably the highest feasible return you can expect over a long period, especially after taxes. Um, if you want to do it more quickly, therefore, you'll need to contribute more. So if you could set aside 2325 a month and are in 3%, you'll get to that goal in five years. So the key thing is to set a goal, what money do I need, when do I need it, and how much am I prepared to set aside? So the lower the return you expect, the longer you're going to take, or the more you need to set aside. And that works on the decumulation phase as well. So if you want to generate a higher income, you'll need a higher return or to withdraw it over a shorter period. And lower returns and longer periods will generate a lower income. So this is the first place to start. How much can I set aside? What's my time horizon? And what sort of return can I target? And as I said, 11% is pretty much the upper end of what you can expect. The Australian Stock Exchange, for example, over its 122-year history has delivered an average annual return of 13%. So an investor, but sorry, but an investor investing on the 1st of January 1900 and leaving it untouched since then would actually have realized 10% uh, because um, you know, if you have a fall of 50%, you've got to double your money to get back to where you started. So down, down years have a bigger impact than upper years. So um, be careful which averages you use in looking at that. Um, if we look at more recent periods, um, over the last decade, so we started on the 1st of July 2013, um, an investment in the US share market as represented by the S&P 500 would have returned 16%. An investment in the Australian Stock Exchange, the ASX 200, the 200 largest stocks on the Australian Stock Exchange, would have returned 8.5%. And bonds represented by the Bloomberg Australian Bond Composite Index would have returned 2.3%. In what was probably the worst period for bonds in living memory, at least my living memory anyway. So what you invest in drives those returns. And that leads us on to the topic of asset allocation. So asset allocation is really the, the way you spread your money between the various asset classes. Um, and it is the key to achieving your investment goals. In the long run, 90% or more of your level of return is driven by your asset allocation. And so that's where we're really going to focus today. Now, you might be wondering why there's a picture of a beekeeper on this slide. And that's because um, I like to think about the various asset classes as being the five Bs of investing. And the five Bs um, are starting at the least risky, um, bills being bank, uh, uh, bank, uh, bank notes, uh, cash, or cash-like, so that's where you term deposits, deposits, and other cash-like investments. Uh, bonds, the second B. Bonds are loans to the government or corporates generally. And um, in most cases, we are talking about high, high credit rated bonds generally to governments, but we can come back and cover that in a, in a future episode. And then the third defensive B is bullion, um, which for most retail investors means gold. And those three Bs, are, we call them defensive assets because they will generate low risk, relatively stable returns over time, but will struggle to beat inflation in the long term. They're in your portfolio for ballast to smooth things and um, reduce the variability in your returns. 
The other side of the coin is growth assets, and these are assets that are capable of beating inflation in the long term. And there's really two of those, um, bricks and businesses. So bricks uh, includes real estate and infrastructure, and they generate equity-like returns, but with more stable returns. And that's because the income they generate. So we look at real estate, um, that generally means offices, factories, warehouses, shops, and they generate long-term, generally CPI-linked income driven from rentals. And um, capital gains or losses in the long term. Uh, infrastructure generally operating in monopolistic um, sectors. You know, we're talking about electricity, water, roads, railways, power stations. All of these, or many of these, generate regu regulated returns where the government dictates the price and demand is relatively inelastic. So those two are the, um, the relatively um, more stable of the growth assets. Um, and then businesses really is shares. So a share is really a small sliver of the ownership in um, in businesses and shareholders share in the income of, or the profit of that business through dividends and through growth in the value of that business over the long term through capital growth. Um, now, um, Daniel says... Um, Interest to see that I consider bullion to be defensive. Um, that's an interesting point, and certainly anyone looking at um, the last decade or so would have seen gold deliver very strong returns. But over time, it's really seen as a an inflation hedge. It's seen as a safe haven by many investors, and for those reasons, it's usually classified as a defensive asset. Um, it does have some growth characteristics. So over some periods, it will give a return greater than inflation. Um, but for an Australian investor in particular, um, gold provides a very good hedge against our currency. Gold is priced in US dollars and um, it tends its price tends to go up when markets turn down, broad generalization. And when markets turn down, investors head to the US dollar, which depresses the Australian dollar and increases the value of the US dollar, which increases the value of gold in Australian dollar terms. So it has a special place for investors who live or spend their money in commodity-based currency. So Canadian investors, South African investors, and Australian investors particularly. Um, but it, I agree. It certainly, I agree with Daniel that it certainly does have some growth characteristics. Um, and then the question about uh, bonds. It's um, you know many younger investors. So anyone whose history of investing is in the last decade, or well, certainly since the GFC, um, bonds may have seen like an odd investment win. Cheap money drove stock markets higher and higher, and we haven't really seen a major downturn um, apart from the very short-lived GFC, uh, sorry, the short-lived COVID blip, which was over before many people realised it. And you know, the market peaked in February 21, 2020, and plummeted very shortly thereafter. But it was back where it was by June, so. That doesn't quite have the same um, memory effect that a GFC or 91 or an 87 or a 74 might have on the investors. So many investors whose experience of investing is really just the last decade or so would feel that bonds don't belong in a long-term portfolio. And um, we'll see this in, in future episodes numerically, but um, you know the move from say 100% equities to 90% equities um, does reduce your volatility significantly, reducing the variability in your returns and increasing your ability to stay the course through downturns. So bonds should not be underestimated and um, cash is 
or your offset account is not a substitute for bonds. So they're the five Bs, and that's why we have a beekeeper on our introduction. And um, every portfolio, or yeah, every portfolio will consist of some or more of each of these. And um, almost every asset you can think of can be slotted into one or potentially two of these um, sectors. And that's always a really good way of looking at an asset. You know, which of these five categories does this investment sit in? And these are arranged broadly from least risk to highest risk. Now, risk is not something to shy away from. Uh, risk is essential for returns, but it is important that you align the risk with your um, with your personality, your time frame, and your willingness and tolerance for risk, and that's really where asset allocation delivers. Um, and that raises the question of, well, how do I decide what the right asset allocation is for me? And the particular point on that is the for me bit, because there is no one one answer. Um, yeah, if you spend enough time on on Reddit, you will find a lot of people pushing the 100% equities option. And um, whilst that might feel good in a generally rising market, um, it's unlikely to be the right answer for most people over the long period. So let's get into have a look at that. And the key issue here is really about behavior. In the words of Benjamin Graham, author of The Intelligent Investor, um, it's a tough book to read. Um, if you do, a, it's a gem of a book. Uh, it is worth persevering. If you do want to read it, there is an annotated version, um, which is uh, worth seeking out if you can find it. Um, but Benjamin Graham said that the investor's chief problem and possibly his worst enemy is likely to be himself. So our behavior is the key to earning the returns that the assets we invest in are capable of delivering. Um, and so that's the, the key to, to, to do, doing that. Um, so that behavior is really driven by um, our risk profile. And risk profile is in part a function of your personality and your makeup. It's in part driven by your level of experience. It's in part driven by your ability to recover from a loss. And um, it is very much psychology driven. Um, so we generally describe risk profiles in a spectrum from conservative to high growth. These names are not particularly consistent. So if you see them applied to a, a fund or an investment, you need to scratch the surface a little bit more and work out what is the asset allocation it's describing. Um, historically, a balanced portfolio would have meant 50-50 or 60-40. Uh, that is 50% defensive, 50% growth, or 60% growth, 40% defensive. Um, it's become corrupted, particularly in the um, in the superannuation space. I mean, there are certainly so-called balanced funds on the market that would be more like an 80-20. Um, but you know, realistically, a conservative is you know, more than 50%, uh, 50% or more defensive assets. Balanced is these days should probably be 60% growth. Growth might be 70 to 80 and high growth. 80 to 90, or perhaps even 100%. And the higher up the risk spectrum you go, the um, greater the proportion of growth assets are in your portfolio, and the greater the variability of the returns that you're going to see. So your expected return goes up the further to the right of this graph that you go, but so too does the variability for your returns. And the variability is the thing that stops people realizing the return. Um, so we use a, um, two tests. We got a, a, we use a general traditional risk profiler, which gets the investor to 
state their preference by asking a number of questions. Um, that's often influenced or people's responses to that are often influenced by current market conditions. When markets are choppy, people tend to be more profile as more conservative. When markets are good, they tend to profile as um, more aggressive. Um, and most people, in my view, overestimate their willingness or capability of withstanding risk. Um, so to temper that, we we use a money personality test, which is what's called a revealed preference test. And that looks at 13 key traits of how you look for money, think about it and make financial decisions. And this can often uh, give you a different answer. And then we sort of meld the two together. You can do this if you go to our website. Um, and part of, of the biggest part of managing risk is diversification. So diversification across asset classes and diversification within asset classes. Um, and our preferred approach to investing is broad-based index funds where that's where that's available. So starting with an asset class, you would then we would then look and go, is there an index that accurately reflects this asset class? Is there an index that's available for investment? Are there funds that track those investments? And if so, is this an asset class where active management does in fact add value? And whilst it is true for anyone who's read any, um, any of the SPIVA reports that active management does not in general add value beyond the cost and tax impact of running it for a large cap liquid markets. So when you look at the large companies in Australia, the ASX 200 or 300, um, it is very difficult to consistently add value as an active manager. The same will be true in the, you know, the great companies of the world, whether that's the S&P 500 in the US or um, the FTSE in London or the DAX in Germany, it is very difficult to consistently add value without taking more risk. And that's an important element. So for large caps, diversified, low cost index funds are the answer. For other sectors, um, bonds in particular, if your requirement to invest in bonds doesn't accord with the investable indexes. So for example, the, um, the Bloomberg index that most funds track, so if you look at uh, VAF or IAF, for example, they both track an index which has an effective duration of about seven years. So if you're looking for a bond investment with a shorter term, that index isn't going to be suitable and those funds therefore won't be suitable, which may force you to look for a, a fund that's benchmarked elsewhere and that may lead you to active funds. Um, for most low, oh, sorry, most high growth portfolios, that is anything over 80%, the role of bonds in that portfolio, and we look at this in more detail in a, a future episode of this, but the role of bonds in that portfolio is to provide a buffer. So you need the closest you can get to a risk-free asset, which to an Australian investor is Australian government bonds. And um, the lowest cost way of getting that is to look at some of these longer dated funds. Um, where you start adding more bonds, so you get to a 60-40, um, you need to start adding some global bonds, which gives you diversification of um, issuer, diversification of uh, duration and diversification of risk, and generally more income. Um, we would generally hedge those those bonds because you're not looking to take currency risk. And historically, that hedge would have added to the income. 
because Australian interest rates are historically below overseas, oh, sorry, above overseas interest rates. That's oddly not true at the moment. So our central bank has not raised rates as fast as our overseas uh, peers. And so Australian interest rates, high though they may feel, um, are behind it, our peers. So that's reduced that impact. Um, and um, the, in contrast, a investment in equity should not be hedged um, because part of the reason for investing offshore is to um, gain access to diversification of both currency and markets and jurisdictions and, and products. So generally hedge bonds, unhedged equities. Um, and it's um, in terms of bonds, it's generally trying to remove a layer of risk, which in today's market costs you money. In a traditional market where Australian interest rates are higher, it will save you money. So, um, so that's the areas where there's big, big liquid funds where indexes are available. Um, when it comes to um, areas like emerging markets um, or small companies, um, then we would generally look to active managers where it is demonstrate that they do add value. Which does bring me on to um, the concept of factor investing. So when we look at equities, um, there are, if you go back to the work of uh, Drs. Farmer and French, um, they've identified three key factors that drive returns on equities. And many active funds are in fact factor funds. Um, so if you look at uh, funds like Platinum, the uh, Perpetual Industrial Fund, they're generally value funds. And um, value is one of the factors of so value shares generally outperform growth shares over time. So a value share is a share where you're buying it on a low multiple of earnings. They're generally considered to be steady, uh, low growth businesses. So much of the ASX 200 is a value investments. So banks, um, banks and industrials, uh, whereas if I look at the S&P 500, that's dominated by growth stocks, you know, the big seven, uh, Amazon, Facebook, or Meta, um, you know, those big seven tech stocks, they are growth stocks, and they've been driving the returns of the S&P 500. Now, a lot of these factors do drive returns in the long run. There's no guarantee that over any individual period they will, and certainly over the last five years or so, value has underperformed growth. So. Yeah, these are not guarantees. Um, so value is one factor. The next factor is um, size. So small companies should deliver higher returns than big companies, largely because they're riskier and therefore investors should be rewarded for more, for taking more risk. And then finally, there's what's called a market or beta. And that is um, the relative volatility of stocks. So we talked about infrastructure and real estate stocks earlier. So shares that move around are less volatile than the market as a whole. Um, we consider those to be low beta stocks. So you'll probably find that uh, in an Australian context, the big banks will be below average beta, not particularly low. Uh, utilities, Telstra, for example, extremely low beta stock. Um, whereas the miners and the tech companies tend to be uh, higher beta. So low beta, lower returns, um, but lower risk. And then, um, so those three factors together drive most of the returns on equities. And this is why, you know, people might talk about ETF investing as being passive investing. Um, passive is used as a contrast to active. But the decision to invest in a particular index is an active decision. So by investing in the ASX 200, not only are you choosing Australian dollars as your investment medium, you're choosing a market that's dominated by 
financials and you're also choosing a value index so the australian asx 200 is largely value dominated and it also means you're choosing large companies all three of those are important decisions in how you allocate your investments or your asset allocation and um, that is far from a passive decision so be very careful about um you thinking that etfs equals index equals passive um, i rather think about it as algorithmic funds where you're using a machine to select the assets rather than um, a human and it's generally mathematically based there is some discretion applied to the construction of the asx 200 um, and other indexes but it is an active decision on the bond front the two factors that grow the bonds are duration so a longer bond should give you a higher return normally sometimes it doesn't and a higher a lower credit rating should give you a higher return so these this is the five factor model of um pharma and french and will explain most of the variance in returns within an asset class so most of the big funds um tend to have a style bias which drives their return um, most of the big funds that you'd be familiar with tend to be value-based uh, you know, warren buffett's classic value investor um, the perpetual industrial fund classic value investors um, uh, platinum global classic value investors um, and those styles go and come at a come and go at in fashion so an etf single trade thousands of assets that you hundreds or thousands of assets and generally low cost easy to acquire brokerage is getting really cheap so it's often a really good way to to get started but it does need to be supplemented by um, active where management does add value um, so that leads you to well how do i pick my portfolio so you start with your overall growth and defensive split which is largely a function of your um, risk profile and investment horizon and having done that you now need to say well within my growth allocation what is my split between bricks and businesses and within each of those, what's my split between um, value, growth, big, small, domestic, global, emerging markets, infrastructure, real estate. And then having concluded that, we then identify whether there's an appropriate index that tracks those and then link that to a, to a fund. Um, when you start looking at active funds, small caps, for example, um, it's generally good to um, go at, take a couple, two or three managers to balance out those styles and manage the volatility a bit more. And having done that, then obviously getting getting set um, in the market, um, investing regularly, trying to remove emotions from it, and importantly, rebalancing regularly. Um, now, Rebalancing is not necessarily about improving returns. There's a lot of very conflicting evidence as to whether it does or doesn't improve returns. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the point of it. The point of it is to maintain your asset allocation. So given that growth assets generally deliver higher returns than defensive assets, left unbalanced, your portfolio will end up being more biased towards growth assets so if you start with an 80 20 and leave it over time that's going to drift towards 90 10 95 5 and now you're taking more risk in a rising market that may not bother you too much but it's when it turns that um, it really matters so rebalancing is about risk mitigation it's about aligning your investments with your risk profile and hence your returns 
So don't look at it as a performance enhancing tool. In academically, it should in theory reduce your returns because you're taking risk off the table. In practice, the discipline of doing this regularly without emotion does tend to deliver higher returns, but it's not not a strong correlation. Um, and it's actually discipline rather than the rebalancing itself. And the same can sort of be said for uh, what we call dollar cost averaging, that is investing regularly in the market um, by putting the same amount of money in without allowing your emotions to, um, to get in the way and buying the assets that are below your target will uh, generally give you a better answer over time. Not a better answer to putting the money all in up front. So if you have a lump sum, mathematically the best answer is to put it all in there. Psychologically, um, that's potentially dangerous, but mathematically that's the one that will give you the highest return. And sort of pulling this all back together again, um, you know, what we learn here is that the market delivers the return. Um, the job of your advisor or your coach or whoever you're taking your guidance from in this is to ensure that return ends up in your pocket. Um, because most investors underperform the assets they invest in. And uh, the US Dalbar study shows that this is potentially you know, two to three percent a year because we tend to invest more money when markets are good and take money off the table when markets are bad. Not necessarily triggering a sell button, but easing off on how much we put in. Yeah, you know, there will be very few um, DIY investors who would have been investing money in September 2008. That would have taken you know, a lot of discipline to see the market fall 30% and continue to invest the same amount of money. Um, a good plan, a regular plan with on automated investments will certainly help. Um, and it's that consistency and quality of your decisions that, that, that will make the difference. Um, some of what an advisor does or your portfolio manager, whether you choose to buy a multi-asset ETF like uh, the Vanguard Diversified Series, or the BlackRock equivalent. Um, part of this allocation is mechanical. You know, it's making sure that you maintain the asset allocation, you uh, reinvest your dividends, you make sure that new money gets invested. Um, we make sure that we manage taxes. Some of it is technical, which is around, you know, that whole tax planning strategy. It's about replacing funds when they're no longer available or they their style has drifted. And then some of it is uh, is behavioral, which is much of it. So that's how you need to get there. So overall growth defensive split, not all 80-20 portfolios will perform the same. Um, allocator between the five Bs. Within each of the five Bs, then look at your allocation to factors, geographies, and size, and choose appropriate funds to achieve that allocation and regular rebalance. Um, so that's, um, I guess, the the formal part of the, uh, the session today. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about me or Life Sherpa, you can uh, go to lifesherpa.com.au. Um, if you'd like to look at some of our managed portfolios, get, try invest.lifesherpa.au. And um, whatever you do, um, you know, tracking the performance and tax of your portfolio, uh, particularly the tax, um, can get extremely onerous, tedious, and error-prone if you're, particularly if you, if you're dollar cost averaging into the market, you've got dividend reinvestment plans switched on, and um, you're having distributions from managed funds. Tracking those taxes can 
be a, a nightmare. And that's where a tool like ShareSight uh, can really strive or, a, or a, a platform, depending on what your, your style is and whether or not you're using an advisor. But uh, certainly you need a tool to keep all that tax. Um, I've seen people do it on spreadsheets. I used to do it on a spreadsheet, but um, with the particularly with the new um, um, AMIST tax regime, uh, it's becoming harder and harder. So I would discourage people from trying to use the spreadsheet method and um, you know, look at a tool like ShareSite to manage that. Um, yes, Daniel makes the point about um, his accountant loves DCA and DRP. Um, absolutely, if you can charge $150 a year to um, sanity check your spreadsheet, um, most suburban accountants would love that. Um, so um, let's see, have a look and see some of the questions here. Um, um, Muganda asked the question about hedging ETFs. Um, can hedging ETFs enough to reduce volatility and risks well I, I spoke purely about currency hedging um, it is possible to um, you know hedge performance um, but obviously the more risk you take off the table um, the lower your return is going to be and um, you know so you could buy a long ASX 200 fund like VAS, or the VAS is 300, but you could buy IOZ, for example, and then buy a short position in the market, making your market risk zero, um, but your returns will almost certainly be negative. Um, there are reasons why you might want to do that. Um, there are so-called market neutral funds where they might take a, um, often that's pairs, um, not Magellan, what's the other fund? Um, there are a handful of them where they might um, you know, go long BHP and short Rio Tinto, where they're actually betting on um, Rio outperforming, oh, sorry, BHP outperforming Rio, regardless of the, what, what the market does. All they're concerned about is the relative performance of those two funds. There's certainly opportunities in that space. They tend to be expensive to to run, um, and highly skilled uh, managers. So probably not to be included in your first six to ten funds, but maybe once you get beyond that and get a much bigger portfolio. So hedging has its place. Um, generally, my philosophy is to hedge bonds and leave equities unhedged. Um, there is a tendency for people to hedge infrastructure and real estate. Um, so it's often hard to find an unhedged infrastructure, global infrastructure fund, but they're worth seeking out. Um, this is sort of a historical thing that if you go back to the 1980s or 90s, um, people saw real estate as a bond substitute and therefore they started to treat these funds like bond funds and um, certainly when I was running around selling infrastructure in the mid 90s when hardly anyone knew what a toll road was in Australia um, we were convincing fund managers that don't you worry about that infrastructure is just a bond and so everyone started to hedge them but in practice they're more like low beta equities and therefore shouldn't be um, hedged in our view. But, you know, um, Vanguard have a reasonably good paper on this where they consider um, that for an Australian investor, some hedging can reduce volatility. Um, I'm not convinced that it comes at cost effectively, but VDHG, which is the Vanguard High Growth Fund, does have a small allocation to hedged equity. So it's some are hedged, some unhedged. Um, always be careful with the having a bet each way approach. Usually in finance, it leads to the worst of both worlds, not the best of both worlds. Um, so Gary says that he agrees with Michael about putting cash under the mattress. Um, that's, um, you know, it's one of those guaranteed investments that um, you guarantee you'll have the same number of dollar bills at the end of the day. But um, 
assuming that silver fish don't eat them, but um, you know, what you're guaranteeing is that the purchasing power of your portfolio is being whittled away. Um, we've had an average inflation rate probably for um, 50 years, 40 years of three to four percent, which means your money purchasing power of your money halves in 24 years. So if you're a 30 year old saving for your retirement, um, ain't going to be that much of it left by the time you get to 90. And, uh, believe me, when you get to my age, 90 is starting to look pretty, pretty, pretty close compared to where it did when I was 30. So, um, you yeah. know, inflation is your enemy when it comes to long term investment. And growth assets are the the antidote to inflation, but you need enough defensive to um, help you sleep at night. So it's really enough growth to deliver you the asset, you, the return you need, and um, enough defensive to um, um, let you sleep at night um, and stay the course. Um, and, you know, depending on what your goal is. So if your goal in 10 years' time is to pay for your um, your daughter's high school education, you probably want a relatively certain outcome. So you might want to tone down the growth allocation there. Whereas if you're looking at a 40, 50, 50 year horizon, then you might want to crank them up a bit. Um, so the question here, here is... Uh, Daniel asked the question about um, have super funds cooked the books a bit by holding commercial property that hasn't been revalued? Um, that's a really interesting question. And this is part of the reason why we don't like unlisted assets at LifeShipper. Um, unlisted assets should in theory give you a higher return because People, investors pay more for liquid assets and therefore they deliver a lower return. So like for like, you would expect to earn a higher return from an unlisted asset. In practice, that's often obscured by some structural things and is a problem for retail investors because getting information to know what you're buying is the hard part. So, um, in relation to real estate specifically, um, the way to, to analyze this, if you look at what's happened to listed real estate prices, so if you go and find any REIT or real estate investment trust on any market, so start with the ASX and look at its share price relative or unit price relative to the net tangible assets of the buildings, effectively the value of the the value of the underlying buildings as represented by the accounts. And what you'll see is that the value of the units has tracked down relative to the book value. That is, they're trading at a discount to book value. And that's a sign that the market values the buildings at less than the valuers did when they drew the last accounts. And that's okay because you're buying on the market at a price that the market thinks those buildings are actually worth. But when you buy units in Australian Super or Hose Plus, um, you're buying those at book value. And so they may or may not reflect the actual value of the underlying asset. Now, people might say, well, I'm not going to spend this for 30 years. Um, does it really matter? And the truth is that that is a transfer of wealth from outgoing investors, um, yeah, baby boomer retirees, and from accumulating uh, millennials and zennials and Gen Xs. So generationally, it's probably not particularly fair. And for that reason, you know, we would generally encourage looking at listed assets. So that's a sort of a general principle about listed assets. There is a particular reporting problem in Australian super funds. 
And that is that APRA, the regulator, allows super funds to categorise unlisted assets differently to the same asset as if it were listed. So listed infrastructure will be categorised as 100% growth assets. So um, whereas unlisted infrastructure, or real estate for that matter, can be categorised as 50% growth, 50% defensive. So many of the super fund, big super funds had in investments in Brisbane Airport, which would be because it was unlisted, was categorised 50% growth, 50% defensive, whereas uni super is 19% holding in Sydney, Airport, which was listed, was considered 100% growth. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that a, a Brisbane airport, you know, a regional airport with high capex requirements, more volatile traffic and more debt um, would be a higher risk investment than Sydney airport, which was you know, mature market, low levels of capex um, and not much, uh, and you know, not a lot of spare capacity. So they weren't relying on growth. So, and more importantly, the day the big super funds took Sydney Airport private by delisting it, they acquired it and stuck more debt into it, and therefore it obviously became a riskier asset, and yet it got classified as 50% intensive. So you really do need to look through the headline numbers if you're going to do this. Um, and... Um, the funds now um, need to disclose those assets. So every fund will have on its website a thing called a PhD or Portfolio Holding Disclosure. Um, they make for very interesting readings. Um, yeah, maybe not the sort of thing you want to do on on vacation, but yeah, it's worth having a uh, having a look through that. We have to have um, one more question, I think. One more question. So the question is, um, REITs or real estate investment trust, growth or defensive? Um, they do have some defensive characteristics. They are what I call low beta equities. So low beta means they move less than the market. So when the market moves 10%, um, you might expect a REIT to move... 0.6 of that, so maybe 6%. So they do add stability to a portfolio, but they are capable of generating growth. So real estate, um, particularly industrial, commercial, uh, retail, tends to be backed by long-term CPI-linked rentals from quality or diversified tenants. So they have some bond-like characteristics in um, in the income side. The growth then is, is often dependent on you know, a manager's ability to develop and lift the usage of that. Um, and similarly for retail, most retail leases in Australia include what's called a turnover rent, which means they the landlord gets a share of the sales in the shop so every time you go into um david jones and spend a hundred dollars westfield get you know, a small percentage of that so that tends to give them some growth characteristics um, but my key definition of a growth asset is is it capable over time of delivering a return in excess of inflation and if the answer to that question is yes then it has at least some growth characteristics and should be in the growth portion of your portfolio. And this is partly why I said that, you know, not all 80-20s or not all 60-40s are identical. You actually have to look at the next layer down. What is my allocation to each of the factors? What's my allocation to each of the Bs? And um, what's the currency or protection overlay none of which is simple trivial or quick um, everyone's probably capable of given enough time interest and effort and commitment is capable of working it out um, but the question is you know how willing are you to stay on top of all of that um, some people you know and I see it 
see a lot of them on online in various forms are actually find this really exciting. Um, to me, if I want excitement, I'll go to the TAB um, or, or Randwick on a Saturday. Um, I want my investments to be um, yeah, stable, steady, um, and not keep me awake at night. But that's why we call it personal finance. It's about money and it's personal. So um, I guess we're running out of time. It's 7.59. How's that for timing, Emangi? Yeah. Um, just, so, just on the dot. We're almost um, so at the end. Up, we just have um, a... Yeah, did you want to put up the poll? And let's get yeah, some I've already put it up. We, we've oh, got right. some votes already, which is great. So in case everyone's not put in their votes in the small poll that I've put in, now's the time. Uh, we hope to do more of these sessions with Win soon, and we love a good uh, crowdfunded answer of what they'd like <laughs> you to talk about. <laughs> Cool. Um, and so obviously got, we'll be back. Quite a few votes. Cool. So we'll be back in the new year. Um, in the meantime, everyone who registers today will get a copy of the recording um, tomorrow um, in your email yeah. that you use to register. And um, we look forward to seeing you again in the new year. And in the meantime, I'd like yeah. to wish everybody a. Um, Happy holiday and a prosperous 2020 and abundant 2024. And thank you, Wince, for your time. Uh, just before we close off, I uh, just wanted to inform that this was uh, con this was information for educational purposes only. This is not financial advice. Uh, we hope that everyone uh, got a lot of learnings today. Uh, I know I did. I got a few key takeaways to take home and just in case you wanted to practice those learnings and we just want to remind you that ShareSite is here to help you prepare for the new year so you can stay on top of performance, asset allocation and tax reporting all year round. Uh, we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, Wins. Pleasure. And, and, and just to reiterate that this was general financial advice. I have a license for that, but it's clearly not personal since I don't know any of you individually. So with that, we're going to sign off and we'll see you again in the new year. Thank you.